All right, good morning, everyone. We'll go ahead and get started in the interest of time. My name is Samantha Martin. I am the Communications Manager at Cleveland Water Alliance. And today we will be discussing our Open Innovation Challenge with Moen. So I will introduce our Director of Innovation and Clusters, E.B. Holst, to kick us off. Take it away, right, Thank you. Thanks, Sam. Well, welcome, everyone. I, uh, I know we have some new visitors to this webinar today, as well as some people who have been with us uh, in the previous webinar. And so for those who were with us for the previous seminar, um, we're gonna just review everything about this challenge. And then um, we're gonna have a little bit deeper dive on some of the Q&A towards the end um, and a little bit more discussion as we go. So let me first just introduce you to the Cleveland Water Alliance. We are um, launching a flagship annual program called our Open Innovation Challenge season. We have two Open Innovation Challenges this year. The first one is with Moen that we're gonna talk about today. And the second one is with six different utilities that are interested in identifying lead service lines without breaking ground. So if you or your colleagues know of anyone who may have interest in that, please go to our web website, Flash Innovate, and um, take a look, forward those materials to your colleagues. We're very excited to, to have real world partners that are gonna be working with us on both of these challenges. So with that, I wanna introduce to you first um, uh, uh, our colleagues at Moen. They're gonna talk us through some of the things they have in mind, the goals they have for what this um, innovation might look like. And uh, let's kick it off there. Hey, good morning, everybody. A uh, couple introductions first. Uh, my name is Mike Shum. I'm from the Moen product development team. And with me are Matt Nichols and Kevin Lumby from our platforms team at Moen. And we're really happy to be here uh, with you. As E.B. said, our first couple slides are repeats for the folks that were here before, so bear with us, but we do have quite a few new folks. First of all, who is Moen? For those that don't know who Moen is, we are the number one faucet brand in North America. Um, that's both in units shipped and in dollars. So we are the number one faucet brand um, in, in, in the country. We are an old company. Uh, over 75 years old. Um, we are headquartered in the Cleveland, Ohio area, and we've been pretty much here for the majority of our, of our history. The portfolio of products, um, hopefully many of you on this call used one of our products this morning, uh, either in your kitchen or in your bathroom. Um, but uh, we uh, design and produce kitchen and bath faucets and accessories. We create shower heads. We have bath safety products for those that need assistance in the bath. We, um, we sell garbage disposals. This is re relatively new for us, but if you walk into a Home Depot, you will see our garbage disposals on shelf there. Most recently, we have about the last five years uh, gotten involved or, or launched products that are connected in smart devices. Um, the ones mentioned here are leak detection and prevention. Think of these as places either in your home or the main water line where water is coming into your home, where we've got a device that will alert a consumer when there is a leak, really providing peace of mind for the homeowner. Our products are sold at all retailers, all wholesalers, design showrooms, and online. So our products are are everywhere. And the last thing I would mention, um, because we are a consumer products company, we have to be excellent at innovation. Um, it is not a guarantee that we get our products on retailer shelves, wholesaler shelves. And when I say retailers, that's Home Depot, Lowe's, Menards, and so forth. It's not a guarantee that we get our products um, on shelf. So what's so critical for us is innovation, innovation that is compelling to a homeowner, to a consumer, or to a owner of a condominium or apartment, that our products are desirable by 
by those channels to create that pull. So our industry is very competitive and innovation is really a means for us to um, uh, outperform our competition. And again, what I would emphasize is with compelling innovations that consumers will love putting in their homes. Okay, EB. Okay, so why this open innovation challenge? Um, one of the areas that we've selected for the future of where we see the integration of technology into our innovation and our innovation products is point of use water quality. I mentioned before about leak detection, being smart and so forth, um, being able to control water inside your home. This is really a, um, a step to understanding the, the quality of the water in your home. It's another logical step for us. Why this open innovation? Again, the point of use water quality can lead us and connect us with our filtration products. Um, I'd say we um, have got um, a quite a bit of an opportunity on the filtration side in our catalog. And wouldn't it be great for a consumer not only to know what type of water they have in their home, but then our ability to point to the type of filter they potentially would use. Again, filtration is not part of our challenge here, but just showing you the connection of, of, of why um, to our business. I mentioned peace of mind to the consumer for leak detection. As a consumer, all of us can appreciate the peace of mind knowing the quality of water we have in our homes. And I did mention the portfolio expansion. Again, we see this as an opportunity across all channels, both retail, wholesale, and so forth. So it's a, a logical business, good business sense for us to proceed down this road. Another reason why we believe this challenge makes so much sense, sense to us is we, we're, we're calling it an ecosystem inside the home of connected and smart devices with our leak detection, with our, our U by Mo and smart faucets and so forth, having yet another product in the ecosystem that eventually we would have the ability to control with an app would be outstanding. Once again, the app and the connection to smart isn't necessarily what the focus of the open innovation challenge is, but you could see the horizon that that would lead us to in connecting it eventually to our ecosystem. Maybe this isn't a surprise, maybe it is a surprise, but Matt and Kevin and I and our, our, our team, we are not the experts here. Um, we want to tap into inventors and researchers just like you with ideas um, to amplify our product development to bring these types of products uh, to market. So that's ultimately the other reason why is just tap in to all of you. So I'll, I'll handle this one, Kevin. Um, so the RFT um, submitted invention for real time cost effective water contaminant sensing device that could be integrated into a consumer's kitchen or bathroom faucet system. And I'll hand it over to Kevin. Yep, so thank you, Mike. Um, as you can see, the RFT has some, some requirements um, and I would consider these a cascade kind of in the order of importance that you see them here on the screen. Um, and as we go through, we've got an individual slide for each of them. So speaking to contaminant detection, um, we picked a few, uh, mostly metallic bases, lead, arsenic, radium, chromium, um, TTHM, copper, and bacteria. Um, I would say let's not be limited. Um, we can, you know, NSF recognizes and the EPA recognize um, many, many more contaminants uh, than the ones listed here. These are some of the more common ones. Um, and aside from copper, these are contaminants that adversely affect health um, at any level. Um, copper is, is healthy in small amounts, and then as you get into larger amounts, is not healthy. Um, but that said, uh, these, are, these are trickier contaminants to detect. Um, what's out there in the market today is, is sort of a total dissolved solids, um, which takes into account not only um, these contaminants and others, um, but minerals and things that are healthy for you. So the focus here is really on things that are, are detrimental to health um, in concentration. Um, 
So this would be the, the primary requirement um, for the RFT. Um, the equipment that exists today, um, it's called an ICPMS, Inductively Coupled Plasma Mass Spectrometry, and I'm reading that, uh, but it's much more industrial um, than it is residential, um, hence the RFT. We're looking for something, obviously, that, that can be sold and used um, hyper-locally in, in consumers' homes. As far as the next uh, requirement goes, real-time communication. Uh, this is important because where contaminants are being detected currently um, in municipal water systems is at the is at the source of, 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 of the filtration for the municipal system. So once it leaves, uh, they don't have any any sort of tracking to what happens to it next. Does it does it gain lead? Um, does it go into a house and with uh, with old plumbing and, and pick up other metals? Um, is it is it picking up copper? Uh, or are you on a well and you don't even have access to the information at all unless you submit a uh, a water quality test, which needs to be mailed in currently, and and you have to wait for results. And of course, it changes throughout the year. Changes with weather. Changes with um, you know just what whatever other environmental impacts uh, uh, might happen you know you could have you could have a spill you could have the the river or or the lake that you're pulling from um, grow algae or bacteria so there's lots of things that could change um, after it leaves the municipal water source or if you have a well system so we want something that's available to the consumer in their home uh, with fairly quick feedback Again, because it's in the home, size and integration is important. Um, so the ideal site would be the point of use where you're drinking the water. Uh, you know, there these contaminants aren't harmful if you're showering, um, so to speak. But if you're drinking the water, um, it's important that you know uh, um, what's coming out of your tap. So ideally, we would like to fit underneath the kitchen cabinet, um, or at least somewhere um, small enough that it could be mounted in the home and out of sight and and I don't want to say out of mind, but um, I guess the connected portion requirement is is what brings that um, to to the forefront of a person a consumer's experience. So intellectual property, uh, there's no requirement for the IP status, but um, I guess the the ability um, to gain IP um, for the device. Um, will we'll be part of the weight of, of measurement when we do the judging of the ideas. Just to that point, um, I want to just emphasize that if you are interested in submitting, there is a copy on our website of the non-disclosure agreement that you would have access to. So Moen is very respectful of um, the IP of inventors and um, and that absolutely is a priority to protect during the process of this of this um, open innovation challenge. Thank you, Evie. So said differently, you don't need to garner IP currently, but we will work together with you as a partner. Um, target cost of goods sold, uh, fifty dollars or less. Um, Obviously, you know, $1,000 systems residentially is, is, is going to be um, a, a tough sell. Um, so 50 is a good, is a good benchmark. Um, this requirement is kind of down the list. So, you know, if you're coming in around 75 or, you know, if you're, you're using something like a Raspberry Pi or an Arduino and, you know, you're at two, three hundred dollars um, but a PCBA that's specifically designed um, could take advantage of, of, of some huge cost gains, then uh, we, could, we could work together. So 50 is a great target, um, but by no means, you know, don't hold back on any ideas that could achieve this for, for you know, a couple hundred bucks. We can work together on trying to get costs down. Hey, uh, Kevin, just a quick clarifier. We got this as a question last time is the cost of goods sold is the cost to produce the device, not the shelf price that we would sell to a consumer. So this is the cost for, yes. for the device. 
Yes, components and assembly. It's okay too, I would say that um, if you don't know what the cost of goods sold is yet, if, if yeah. you're really in the early stages of putting something together, that's okay too. Um, you know, the Moen team can take a look and, and as mentioned, they can um, help kind of walk through how that might look in an actual production. Yeah, if you're if you're focused on the first three requirements, mainly the ability to, to, to detect the contaminants, um, the real time uh, information and the I guess size or packaging that, that could be used residentially. If, if those three look good and you don't know about IP or cost, uh, don't hold back. We'll work together. So Thanks so much. Um, I'm going to just jump in here and talk through the schedule for everyone just so we, we kind of see what, what our timeline looks like and how much time you have to get questions in and indicate your interest and your proposals. So we had our first RFT webinar on March 17th. Um, we've got an ongoing Q&A period. Questions can be submitted to OI dash 2021.pou at cleawad.org. This is also in the RFT, this whole schedule for you to reference. Um, this is our second webinar. This will also be made available. We're recording this. So this will also be available for download as needed. The letters of intent are due April 16th. This is a really simple format. Essentially, it just gives us a sense of you know, how many people are interested in, in, in submitting, you know, get a sense of kind of what's out there so that we can prepare on our end for accommodating um, potential folks that would be invited to um, do some testing. Really simple format again is in, um, in the RFT itself. And then the full proposals are due June 14th. I just wanna point out that this time um, between today and that proposal deadline is really to promote that all of you try to, um, you know, partner where needed, um, you know, really look at whatever inventions you may have that would fit the actual challenge we're describing here um, so that you're positioning yourself to really be able to, uh, you know, to work with this, this mowing team. It's a very unique opportunity. And then um, once the proposals are in, we're gonna give the Moen team just a, a little bit of time to review those final proposals and identify um, the ones of, of highest interest to be invited for some direct testing with the Moen team. Once those <laughs> selections have been made, um, the, the testing itself will be by appointment only. Uh, we're gonna work with, with you as invitees to find some time that, um, uh, you know, provided that the COVID restrictions have eased a little bit to potentially schedule time to come directly out to the facilities here or to make other accommodations. And that testing period will be open for most of the summer, July 1 to August 28th. And then in September, we will announce the winner. So just a Quick highlight, this is the challenge. Submit an invention for real-time cost-effective water contaminant sensing device that can be integrated into residential consumers, kitchens, or bathroom faucet systems. Uh, there's prize opportunity, certainly media exposure, and um, you know some potential longer-term opportunities directly with mowing. Yeah. We've had a few questions come in and everyone please continue to submit any questions to the Q&A or the chat function and I'm happy to um, share them and pose them to our panelists. And like Evie said, this uh, will be recorded and everyone who has registered, I know we have folks from all over the world, so some folks can't tune in live, this will be emailed to all registrants, um, the recording of, of today. Um, so the first question I have is who will own the IP?
Mike, did you want to speak to that or did you want me to answer that one? Go ahead, Kevin. Um, so the, the non-disclosure agreement would uh, essentially protect both parties um, in the early stages. Um, if you're selected as the winner um, and we choose to, to make a partnership going forward, um, I think that would all be decided then. Um, and I don't want to get too specific, but I, I could see it going several different directions um, where both Moen and the, the inventor um, names are on the patent. Um, I could see it being something that is sold to Moen, or I could see it as, you know, if it's not a technology that we select, um, the individual could retain that IP themselves. I would just add, Kevin, you summed it perfectly. Um, what I would say from experience, uh, what for us in the last several years, we've had instances of pretty much all of those that Kevin mentioned. So I think the point is, is that we've got flexibility depending on the individual case and whatever makes most sense, we'll explore those options once we get a little further along. Great, thank you. Uh, the second question is, has Moen performed any unbiased customer discovery to, to understand if customers are eager to pay for this type of solution being proposed? In our efforts, it is not clear that consumers would pay for a connected device to measure a single contaminant. Uh, we do have some knowledge um, and some consumer research around this. Um, you know, the, the, the thing to consider is that we're, we're trying to build an ecosystem of water. Um, so this could be a device that's integrated into other products that we sell. Um, it could be a standalone device, um, depending on what the final sale price would be. Um, and it could also be, you know, if we end up with one single contaminant, um, you know, it could be a canary in the coal mine for something's wrong with your water. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be a device that, that can track every single contaminant that the EPA and NSF recognize as harmful. Um, so it can go lots of ways, but we do have lots of consumer research that says, you know, consumers are, are concerned about what they're getting. Um, and there's a few that they're aware of, you know, lead, um, you know, arsenic, things like that. And there's a whole lot that consumers are not aware of. So this is Moen trying to provide peace of mind to everyone without having to make them, you know, chemical engineers. The thing I would add there is uh, everyone hopefully on the call knows that uh, innovation is hopefully meeting unmet needs. Um, and the, the, the questioner there is spot on. We wanna make sure there's the demand there. And so, yes, we've done um, research uh, to date. But uh, rest assured, going forward, uh, we will continue to do uh, consumer in-home research with, uh, with our team internally to understand the, uh, the, the business opportunity for this as well. I'm gonna add something in here too, that um, I think what happened in Flint, Michigan actually has heightened consumers' uh, sensitivity to you know, what is in our water. Um, and ironically, I think that the added spotlight on lead service lines that's represented in our other open innovation challenge will continue to push that. That's a federal mandate coming down um, around lead service lines that are known to be in, in uh, the lines to homes all over the country. So that's one thing. And then the second touch point I would also add is, you know, particularly in rural settings, residential rural homes are, are really quite accustomed to bringing in filtration systems because they're on well water. And um, certainly in terms of those profile of homes, it's a lot less expensive to find out what's in their water first before they make a really big investment in a filtration home system. Um, along those lines, we got a follow up question. Is Moen willing to share the consumer research with competing teams? Innovators have a much higher risk reward equation to consider than a large corporation. You're on mute, Mike. Sorry. 
I, I think once again, we would take that on a case by case basis. Um, I think the consumer research generically is telling us that consumers are interested in understanding the quality of water, period. I think the next round of consumer research using the design thinking process that Moen uses, very common use in all different types of industries, is actually taking concepts that we have in the consumer's home to understand um, uh, the benefits of the device, um, you know, get some feedback there. And so once again, I would say that would be research to come um, and obviously to be shared with the submitting um, uh, idea. So I, I, I think at this point, what we do know is there's interest in consumers to understand the quality of water. The solution or solutions that we're investigating, that's part of the research that needs to be done to see if the, if the idea that we are proposing makes sense. Okay, I might not get this next question totally right. So you might need to walk me through it here. Is total ion concentration by ion of interest? And are you also interested in industrial size and scale where the invention not only senses, but also remediates and produces ion concentrations like orthophosphates, ammonia, calcium, et cetera? I would say the industrial size is currently out of scope. Um, you know, we're we're a homeowners residential brand um, mainly right now. Um, if it's a solution that's available that's scalable, and and the RFT submission is a ver a version of a scaled down industrial system, um, yes, absolutely, we're interested in it. Um, but to that point. Um, as far as detecting the ions and in, in concentration and which specific elements are creating those ions, yes, that is of interest. Um, you know, don't stick to the six or eight contaminants we listed. Um, if there's other things that are present in water that are recognized by the EPA or NSF um, as harmful, you know, feel free to include those in scope. One thing I would add to that, uh, I, I mentioned early in the intro, um, one of the channels that we sell to is a funny word, we call it multifamily. And those are large apartment complexes, condominiums and so forth. And so um, our leak detection uh, technology is finding a home in some of those multifamily uh, applications. So an apartment owner can know if a building is, is, is experiencing uh, issues. Kevin's right, we're a consumer products company, it's the home where we're focused, but in a multifamily channel, uh, the multifamily channel where there is you know, multiple um, homes in a, in a uh, like in an apartment or condominium, certainly there'd be an application for, for that. The next question is, do you have existing architectures for GPS communications, power processing and storage in the water supply chain? Um, it, it sounds, and please submit and correct me if I'm wrong, if I'm answering this incorrectly. It sounds like you're asking, do we have a digital connected platform available to communicate results from a device? The answer to that is yes. Um, so, you know, thinking about the requirements, the technology um, to detect the contaminants is most important. Um, the size and cost are, are less important. Real time is important. Um, the connected portion of it, we can handle that as long as we can get some sort of output from the device um, that can interface to our digital systems. So, so GPS, things like that, we can do that, yes. Yeah, I kind of covered that a little bit on the uh, uh, what we were looking for. That is the ultimate horizon of, of where we're headed. Um, and then all of this water ecosystem data that Moen is creating or, or consumers creating, absolutely, that's where we want to go. But I think the priorities that Kevin mentioned are, are spot on that uh, are nice to have, um, but not a need to have at this minute, at this second. I'm not sure if this is a follow-up or, or just a comment. Output is USB with serial stream containing concentrations. 
that would be acceptable. Um, looks like we have a few more. Can you describe the processes, methodologies, bench and benchmarks that would be used? Um, as far as testing of the devices, you know, performance testing, um, there's, it's going to be case by case, but in general, there will be a challenge test where we um, put a known concentration of a contaminant um, that the device is, is meant to detect um, into a volume of water um, so we can judge its accuracy. Um, we would probably do some sort of precision testing as well, um, you know, mess with variables like temperature or other things that shouldn't affect concentration and see if the device responds accordingly and, and precisely. Um, so an accuracy challenge, a precision challenge, um, and then I guess methodologies for those tests, um, aside from the known amount of contaminant in a known volume of water. Um, as I mentioned, the I, I don't want to say the whole name again, but the ICPMS device, um, we have that capability in-house that can pick up some of the contaminants, not all of them. Um, so we would use the mass spectrometry um, as we do for lead today um, to be able to check some contaminants, um, but not necessarily all um, in an unknown quantity, um, sort of as a calibration of the device. Um, you know, if we have multiple entrants, we would probably do relative performance testing between a few of them. Um, I'm trying to think what other tests we might do. Uh, we do have partnerships with external labs. We might send some things to them. Um, unfortunately, I'm not an expert on what capabilities they have, um, but you know, we might need to send some things out if it, if it can't be done on the ICPMS test on that bench. Um, and then the last thing I would say is, you know, methodologies used by NSF in contaminant detection for filter performance, we would probably do variations on those tests as well. Um, so they're more focused on putting in a known amount of contaminants and then measuring how much has been absorbed by the filter and what comes out. We would be mostly concerned about what's in the water currently and whether or not the accuracy of the machine is, is um, within reasonable tolerance. So hopefully that, that answers it, but it's also a big, depends on what the device is. What level of lead detection is acceptable for passing a first test? 15 PBB, 50 PBB, PPB, low PPB detection is exceedingly difficult outside of lab settings. Yeah, so that's a great question, and and that's going to be a um, that that's going to be a, a topic that we're going to need to discuss as far as how we want to judge these devices. So you know, if you've got a margin of error, uh, let's call it ten percent or fifty percent, whatever it is, um, we would compare entrants uh, on their performance, um, and we would also build in a safety factor. You know, so if, if let's say 10 PPB is harmful um, and you can detect one PPB, um, then we're pretty, we're pretty okay. Um, if you're picking a different contaminant and you know 30 ppm is acceptable and you can detect to you know one PPB, then you know you've got something, right? You're never going to you're never going to risk um, the tolerance of giving you a false positive or a false negative on that device. So it's contaminant by contaminant. And I would say the guidelines we're going to follow are the concentrations provided by the EPA um, and NSF in, in their testing. Uh, specifically for lead, I'm sorry, I don't know that one off the top of my head, but um, you know, if your device can detect it in any level um, that's, let's say, within the same order of magnitude um, as what is considered safe, um, then we're interested. Sorry, that was a very generic answer, um, but you know, each one of these contaminants is different. You know, you could be talking parts per million or parts per billion. Um, so and a follow-up to that, how were these particular contaminants described in the RFT selected for Moen's focus and interest? 
Um, so rather than uh, pepper a hundred or I can't even think of how many different contaminants are listed by NSF and EPA, but you know it, it's definitely dozens, if not hundreds. Uh, rather than list all of them, uh, we tried to focus on on contaminants that are harmful in almost any quantities, uh, like like I said, with the exception being copper. Um, and then everything on the list, um, I think, except for the the was it the TT TTHM um, is something that would be detected in a in a TDS test, um, but not necessarily you know um, detectable as harmful versus helpful. Um, as I mentioned, TDS includes minerals and salts and things like that. So, so we tried to tried to focus on things that are hard to separate from a normal TDS test and things that are harmful to your health um, and most common um, as far as contaminants that you would experience uh, around the country. Um, but tried to spare you of the giant list of 100 or so contaminants. And I think this one has has been um, answered in a few different ways, but just to reiterate, does Moen envision an all-in-one device or could there be multiple components? Several different sensors that track contaminants installed in, within a pipe, data collected display, displayed throughout the cloud or a single device? That's a good question. Um, the focus of the RFT is probably an all-in-one device. Uh, I don't wanna limit, you know, there there's, if the device has several different sensors or methods of detection to get several different contaminants, um, I could see us spinning off, you know, one or two of those contaminants for maybe a showering device or, or something else where, you know, you're less concerned about um, less concerned about maybe metals in your shower than you are in your drinking water, um, but you're more concerned about chlorine or minerals you know, hard water in your shower than you are um, in your drinking water. So um, I would say standalone device is kind of the, the ideal, um, but absolutely we could, we could do a daisy chain of several different devices um, if it came down to detecting different contaminants. And I think you touched on this briefly um, with one of the last questions. Could you describe the potential near-term, long-term outcomes for one or more promising devices? Near-term, what would further testing look like? Long-term, possibly licensing, acquisition, other? Yeah, I think we uh, we did mention that, um, Sam. Um, I, I, it, it's going to be the, it depends, um, and maybe not exactly what the asker, the, uh, the questioner, um, was it, was asking, but I hope what we've painted is that depending on the device and depending on um, the application, we've done it several different ways with uh, other companies and vendors over the years, and we will do what makes most sense in this case for that particular inventor. So um, yeah, we've got a variety of ways to uh, to um, to manage this as we go forward. And I think that answers this, this next question. Is Moen or CWA willing to engage with individual teams separate from this in innovation challenge? There's a lot of uncertainty about what is being sought. And it sounds like a, a lot of things are gonna be on a case-by-case -case basis here. Yeah, that's right. And, and I, I, I think what AD covered in the uh, letter of intent and so forth, once you step forward, raise your hand, you know, I, I think what at least our hope is, is that with the right application, you're going to see us engage with you um, more closely as the your device or your invention makes sense. Um, you know, we're in this uh, just trying to feel each other out kind of mode right now. But you know, for the right idea, for the right invention, absolutely want we want this to work. We want this to be something that consumers are going to put in their home. So absolutely, we will engage with you more closely on a case by case basis once we get a little further along in the in the challenge. Let me just uh, add a couple of comments in there as well though. So this process, this process is really intended to open up some opportunities to innovators, but we also are, have structured this process to provide Moen with a little bit of a buffer. Um, so that said, um, you know, don't contact 
the Moen team directly. Use the channels that are outlined inside of the RFT, direct um, attempts to contact during the course of this challenge could potentially you know, eliminate your chances to be considered. So, um, you know, let's, let's make sure that we're, at, you know, we want to be as accommodating as possible. We have a channel for you to ask questions outside of this webinar, you know, if something occurs to you later, but, um, but we really want to discourage direct contact. That said, you know, I, I also recognize that there may be people on this call that have some ideas that don't directly fit into this challenge. Um, you know, use, use the same channels and, um, you know, the things that come in through our, our uh, um, CLEWA.org email address are, are going to sooner or later get to the Moen team. It'll be up to them if they want to follow up with you directly in some other way. Um, so, uh, you know, just a heads up there. We, uh, we want to make sure that this is as smooth as possible for everyone involved and, and manageable. I think that's all of the questions that we've had come in. Great. Well, this has been a, a really great session. Thank you for um, some really great uh, inquiries here. Thanks to the Moen team for working with us on this and we're excited to see what's ahead. Thanks everyone. Thanks everybody. Thank you.